ever inaugural uh, innovation panel. And I want to welcome, we are very lucky to have the following guests. I'm going to be introducing from my far right on across. First, we have uh, Ben Gibbs. He is the co founder and CEO of Ready Robotics. He received his um, degree, uh, Bachelor of Arts in Economics from John Hopkins University. Uh, and he worked in various positions there before his current um, role at Ready Robotics, where he worked with their communication strategy group, um, where they translate new inventions to market. And he also worked with um, their intellectual properties division, where um, they controlled investment decisions for intellectual properties there at the university. Um, next, we have Mick Arnold, class of 1989. He is the president of Arnold Packaging. He began there at the age of 13 working in various positions in the warehouse, and he worked his way up, and he's now been the president there since 1995. Five. And he received his degree from Radford University. And then last, we have, um, I'm going to give him a short name, Kel, Kel Gorin. He is the founder and chief technical officer of Ready Robotics. Um, he received his Bachelor of Science from the University of Arizona in Optical Science and Engineering. He received his Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from Carnegie Mellon, and he received his PhD from John Hopkins in just robotics in general, where he focused on novel surgical um, interfaces, human-computer interactions, and industrial robotic systems. Um, and then he went on to do a postdoc fellowship at John Hopkins as well. So, and, and myself, I am Kelly Wilson, the Director of Innovation here at Severn School. Um, so, welcome, a great big welcome to all Oh, and I forgot over here is our friend. Is there a special name for this? The task mate. So, he is in the process of, of doing a, a routine that was programmed um, by someone just a, like a few months older than our seniors um, right before this event, and we may have him speak later on as well. Steven, come on up. This is Steven. We all set him up. <laughs> Steven, actually, just before we get started, real quickly, I have to watch out for the robot moving arm. It's been programmed to come smack me if I ask an inappropriate question. <laughs> Steven, can you just um, say what you've done with him this morning? So basically, I've just prepared it um, to take these blocks, uh, put it into a grid pattern on the um, cutouts there, and then it replaces them on the sled up here, um, and it just repeats that. So uh, you can use this for a number of tasks, and I, I've only seen the beginning of this, so. Thank you, Stephen. All right, so I, I want to take a, a step back in time with these gentlemen um, into to their high school years. And first say, looking back, and this is for, for any of you and all of you, um, was there a particular moment or experience in high school that influenced where you are now? Uh, <laughs> so I guess for me, um, a lot of the stuff that we did in high school was like, you know, typical take classes and stuff. But I was lucky enough to have a physics teacher who had us do this challenge. And I think some of you guys might be doing the same sort of thing, where we had to build a little wooden vehicle that would go up to the top of a mountain and would uh, carry things up to the top and then let go of them and bring them back down. And, but it was all rubber band powered, so it was like really hard to figure out how much energy you needed to store in this little guy so that he could actually make it up to the top of the hill and then make it back down and do it a number of times. And, um, that was really a moment where I was like, wow, I can make things that you know actually do real work. Um, that, you know, I'm, I'm taking the math and science that I'm learning in class and actually applying it and making cool stuff that does real things in the real world. So that was really a moment for me um, because I got to see, you know, the, the calculations that I had done and the math that I had done actually make something move. And, and I could see very quickly that if I had gotten my math wrong, it wouldn't get to the top of the hill or it wouldn't grab as many bottles as it could. And so it became very real for me rather than just sitting there with a the calculator, you know, on my test or whatever. Um, well, as Kelly said, my uh, career started at 13, and that's because uh, while attending Severn, I got my first C in seventh grade. 
So, <laughs> so uh, my father thought it would be good for me to, you know, see some real world work, and uh, I, I started working on one of our cardboard manufacturing machines. And I think first I was, again, this is a lot longer than these guys are a lot younger than I. Um, for me, I think I was intrigued initially by the fact that you could take a flat piece of material like cardboard, and you could score it and slot it, and you could make it into a three-dimensional material. So from there. Um, I spent a lot of time eating that machine, and I was, again, intrigued, I was very curious how the mechanics work, you know, we would, we would hit a switch, and the switch would make a blade come down, and it would score and slot, and it would do it again. And then I got uh, up to speed on production schedules, and it became even competitive, where this day I made 100 things, the next day I made 200 things, and I would spend time watching and trying to understand how I could make things faster. So I would say that was the start of it. It wasn't necessarily high school, but when I got into the manufacturing plan, um, I knew that's where I wanted to be. So for me, it was actually joining a, a business club in high school when I was 16. And what we had to do was actually set up a, a snack shack, a shack at our local YMCA, where we had to put in all the processes, the inventory, the accounting, and all the rest of that. And it was Really an interesting experience to be able to see how a little hard work and organization can turn five dollars into to five hundred dollars, and after that, I was really just hooked on business. Great, thanks, guys. Um, so next, Ben, and this is uh, from a student. Given your degree in economics, how has it supported your current role as CEO? So economics is really about the study and creation of models that, to a certain extent, reflect the real world of what's going on there. And that's something that's tremendously valuable in uh, the role of running a company because a lot of what you're doing in the beginning is creating models about how customers might respond to you, how the market forces are going to impact what you're trying to do. And so it's really a, a skill that uh, I use every day, just building out these type of financial models and business models to really drive the company forward. Great, thank you. Um, for Kel, um, you didn't grow up with a cell phone or a mini computer in your hand like these guys have. Um, like, how and when did you actually get into the robotics phase of your career? Like, was it in college? Yeah, so I actually was uh, really interested in electronics for a long time because, again, I really liked the idea that I could make stuff. Um, I, I dabbled in physics a little bit, and unfortunately, it was a little too theoretical for me. So I really was into electronics because I could, like, do the math, build a circuit, the circuit would do something, turn on lights, and move a little thingy around, all of all that stuff, right? So I uh, ended up going to Carnegie Mellon, and I was very into the electronic side of it, but I had also got a background in cameras, uh, in how to design and build cameras and lenses to take pictures of things. Um, and uh, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, there was something called the Google Lunar X Prize, which was started, which was basically an award that Google put out with a $10 million prize if you could take a robot and build it so that it would go to the moon, literally, and drive around and send back video, um, which ends up costing a lot of money, and it's, you know, it, it, it's very hard to do that, but one of the interesting things was is that I knew more about how cameras work than most of the people there, and so I sort of grabbed onto that and, uh, and started doing a lot of robotics because I understood how the, cam the technology behind how the robot would actually see um, and while it was driving around and the video that was in that. So that really let me, you know, get an eye on to a lot of the other parts of robotics about how to make things, devices like this actually move, how they're powered, how they manipulate objects, how they grab things, how they, how they use their senses that they have, whether it's cameras or sensing force when they pick things up. All of those different pieces I got a lot of sort of a crash course in. Um, and I decided that that was really, really interesting stuff and I wanted to go in that direction. As a follow-up, like when you work on these projects, how many people are involved in a team? Is it a solo effort? How does that kind of work down? It's usually a lot of people. What will happen is, is somebody will come up with a really cool idea for how to do something and they'll build a prototype um, of it, right? You'll, you'll sit down and you'll build your little board and you'll have the wheels and it'll move around. But eventually you get to the point where people, uh, the, the things that you need to know um, get much more complicated, right? And you can't know everything. So what you really learn is how to work on a team of people that are very specialized. So at Ready Robotics, like, you know, I built out a very rough prototype of what you see here, which is our finished product, it, while I was a PhD student, and I built most of it. And it was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, like it was, you know, there was a lot of stuff that wasn't built as well as it as as it should be, right? But that was because I was doing everything. 
as soon as we started the company, I was able to hire people that are the best at doing the mechanical side, the best at doing software, the best at doing computer vision, the best at building electronics, right? And so now that I have this team where all of the different pieces of the product are, are there's a person who is really, really good at that one piece working on a team, you actually can build stuff that, you know, actually works and the customers would want to buy rather than just sort of something you can glom together. So absolutely, you can do it yourself. But eventually, you're going to get to the point where you need to bring other people in. You need to form relationships and have other people with their specific expertise to help you make all of those individual pieces as best, as good as they can possibly be. And then you just put all that together. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Mick, um, you worked your way up through the company and have been there for over 24 years now. Can you describe how the packaging and manufacturing industry has changed over your tenure? Um, sure. I think, you know, we're involved in automation and the reason we're here today is to give you a little bit of a glimpse into what's going on in the modern manufacturing plant. And, and I think one of the things we work on, you know, Ben and I were on a panel this morning and workforce development has become a very big part of the focus of manufacturing. And one of the big things is that manufacturing is not dirty, dingy, and dangerous. If you see what, what Kel and his group are built here, um, when we go into big manufacturing plants, it's, they're, they're amazing um, in what they do and what they create. And the big change, are, so because of that, there is a workforce shortage. Products like this are born because manufacturers can't find enough people to do what they need to do, and it no longer becomes cost effective. So, whether it's the cotton gin, or if you look at some of the inventions over time, those came because of a shortage, something was needed. They needed to process cotton faster. Well, this has become, because if you look at machine shops and some of these more trades-based companies, they're having a hard time finding the workforce to machine, lathe, whatever the part of the process would be that a human used to do. Um, there's a, a generational gap right now where if you look at people in these plants, they tend to be a little bit older. There's a little bit of influx of younger with some of the work that's been done. But in the middle, there's a very big gap. So Kel and, and Ben have solved for a big problem in the manufacturing world where the manufacturers can't get enough people to do this type of process. So in a typical application, we would wheel this in front of a, a, a press brake or some type of machine that is doing a process. And then we would program it to do it over and over and over again. So the real thing that they've solved for is freeing up smart people to do smart things. So the biggest change that I've seen in manufacturing is the amount of automation, but I think the thing to understand is where the need comes from. Yeah, and I, and I think about for you guys, it's it, that's that thing, that change that what we're trying to help instill in you guys is that idea that their jobs are shifting from, from one area, maybe for more manufacturing, up into that creative aspect. Well, and, and real thing, just to say too, I mean, one of the things we talk about a lot is AI, right? Everybody's heard about of, of AI and probably know artificial, artificial intelligence. intelligence. Let's think of augmented intelligence. For, so what we're doing, or, or what Ben and Kelly are trying to solve for, is augmented intelligence, where we use tools like this to free smart people up to do something. That actually is a perfect segue to my next question, which was from a student, and it says, how do you think machine learning will impact manufacturing? Um, and just for those of you who didn't know machine learning, because I didn't know exactly what it was, um, the definition I found, and they can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, it's computers having the ability to learn without explicit, explicitly being programmed. So, um, for any of you, so again, the question was, how do you think machine learning will impact manufacturing? What a, a, a lot of factories look like today. You've got a guy who's 65, He's been working there for 30 years, and he makes a widget, whether it's a piece of metal that goes into something larger, or it's a, you know, a piece of plastic that ends up going in one of your phones, something like that, right? And he has a huge amount of knowledge about how that piece is made, right? That little piece of metal is a product of 30 years of him with all these tricks and setting up the machine to make this piece of metal better than anybody else can, right? When you think about, um, looking at that job and saying, and he's going to retire eventually, and I don't have another person that has that bank of knowledge, that 30 years of experience. So I have to think about how, if I have a robot there now making that piece of metal, I need to make that robot more intelligent itself. Because 
he can't sort of get everything that's in his head into the robot, right? There's never going to be the little tricks where it's like, oh, if I push it in too far, it's going to jam and I won't be able to pull it out, so I have to just push it in just enough, like right? Things like that where, where um, you end up having these, these, the, the knowledge that he's built up really be critical to the process. Well, if I can build a smarter robot where the robot, not super smart, it doesn't have to know how to do the task all by itself. Maybe one day it will, right? But if it is smart enough just to make a simple decision like, hey, if I push this in too far, it's going to get stuck, then what I can do is I can actually have a machine where it is there doing his job um, now that he's retired. And it's actually being productive rather than having to have someone come and babysit the robot. Because if it's, if it's just a dumb machine that sits there and just does a motion over and over again, it's not really valuable. What's valuable is if it can adapt to its environment. And the environment is always changing, right? Things wear down. Things change positions, right? That box is not always going to be in the exact same place every time. And so the robot's ability to actually deal with that and um, make sense of it and adapt to it is what's really critical. And that's what's really driving machine learning in, in the manufacturing space is being able to adapt to variation, being able to adapt to an environment which is always changing because people do that, right? People adapt to when the environment changes. Does the task mate currently have some of those capabilities? It does, yes. Cool. Um, <coughs> it's, also, it's, about, just on that. it's also about flexibility of workforce. You know, manufacturers struggle with being able to deploy the right people to the right place at the right time. So tools like this give manufacturers the ability to, to deploy the right type of workforce to the right place. So flexibility is a big, big need for manufacturers in today's world. So for you guys out here, this is just a, a quick poll. How many of your parents either work in an environment where there's something manufactured or maybe own a company where something is manufactured and not software, but just by a show of hands, how many parents do? Seems good. It's like quite quite a high percentage. So Nick, you were you were one to well, yeah, it's some right on, yeah, it's right, it's right on the average, right? So the, uh, the GDP perspective, right, gross domestic product in the United States, 17% is contributed by manufacturing. So that's always an interesting poll. Are 17% of you, or if you look at your parents, do we have that similar 17%? that are contributing to GDP through manufacturing. <coughs> Looks like it's probably pretty close. Yeah, and overall, productivity in the manufacturing space has been increasing with each passing year, even though in some instances, <coughs> overall number of people involved in manufacturing has been decreasing. And that's been thanks to things like automation, machine learning. And it's a, a trend you'll often see in industry. I mean, back in the 1800s, most people were involved in farming their own food to eat. And now we live in a world where less than 2% of the population in the U.S. grows enough food to support not only the entire U.S., but enough for us to export it globally to other countries as well. And so it's going to be through automation and computer programming, machine learning, that the U.S. is going to be able to maintain its competitive edge in manufacturing. Great. Thanks. This is another one uh, from a student, and Ben, I'm going to pass this off to you. It says, uh, being that Ready Robotics is less than two years old, has the company reached profitability yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it asks you, there's so, follow-up, and where is your main source of revenue? So this is actually a, an interesting point. So we're, we're what's known as a, a venture-backed company. So we've received money from venture capital firms, primarily out of New York, but also some here in Maryland, like Sagamore Ventures, which is actually the, the investment firm that is funded by Kevin Plank, the CEO of Under Armour. A venture-backed company is not designed in the beginning to actually be profitable. In fact, many VCs will kind of look at you weird if you have a plan to grow the company to profitability in like 18 months because they don't think you're then growing fast enough. And so this is why you see companies like Uber and other things like that that have raised hundreds of millions or, or billions of dollars in some cases, and they're still losing money. So if everything goes according to plan, we will continue to lose money for several more years. <laughs> and, and look, too, and VCs are looking for, uh, for people that aren't going to fail. So, you know, what was the, good, what was the comment this morning? We don't want to talk to you unless you've lost someone else's money first. Yeah. So yeah, that's a VC rule. So is this your main product, or do you have other products as well? Uh, this is, in fact, our, our main product. Okay, cool. Um, 
So for, for Bennett and, and Arkell, um, so what industries are your robots currently working in and are there other industry areas that you're currently pursuing? So we are primarily in the metalworking space in machine tending, dealing with CNC lathes, mills, things of that nature. But because we have a really flexible platform for robotic automation, it's very easy for us to get into other industries as well. So we've had deployments in the food production space, in plastics, in apparel manufacturing, and uh, just recently into a Um, let's see, from there, so um, for all, um, where or what trends do you see um, the future for your industries? Like, where do you see this going? Um, so I think that uh, manufacturing is going to get a lot more automated. Um, I think that a lot of the work that we do um, is going to end up being done by machines, not because um, because it ends up being more cost effective. Um, but that's actually really interesting because what that does is uh, it makes it so that when I, let's say I invent something, right? I invent a, a new little electronic device, right? That's great, I have a prototype, awesome. I'm gonna send it to China to actually be manufactured because it's really cheap there, right? So that means that I'm probably gonna take 18 months to actually set that up so that now they can make my little widget and then they bring it back here and I sell it in the US, right? That means that if I want to make any changes, right? Like if I want to change anything about that device, it's another 18 months, right? Well, I make changes to stuff all the time, right? I want to be very rapid. I want to figure out what's wrong. I want to listen to my customers. I want to have people use it and break it and think that things could be better and then I want to change it so that it ends up being better. If I have to wait 18 months to do that every single time, that's terrible, right? If I can make stuff in the States using automation, if I have a, a little robotic factory sitting next door that I can walk in and sort of Iron Man style program it and have it just spit out stuff that, um, that you know, that it reflects my changes, that means that my design cycle is less expensive. It means that I can very quickly make products that people like better because I don't have to sort of wait around for some manufacturing cycle to kick in so that people like my stuff because I haven't managed to change it properly. So it means that I can be much more rapid in how I develop the product, how I engineer it, how I improve it, how I incorporate feedback from people because the manufacturing is here, it's right here, and, it, and, it, and it's cost effective to have it there. Right now, it's not cost effective to have a, a little factory sitting there just for me. But one day it will be. I know you guys like have heard of Kickstarter probably. Maybe some of you have even like funded stuff on Kickstarter. The problem with Kickstarter is, is somebody creates something cool, right? Well, you guys want to buy it. So you get on Kickstarter, you pay your $20, and you, you get this thing. Well, he, the guy, is like, oh my gosh, this is great. I have 100,000 orders. What do I do? I can't make a million of them. If I, if I got a million orders, I'd go to China, right? That's, that's not a problem. But 100,000, I kind of have to do it myself and that's gonna suck. So there's really not capacity that's close to home, that's like in his backyard or in his basement that he can use to make that thing, to make that 100,000 of that widget that you guys bought. In the future, we'll have these automated factories that actually give you that capability where you can build a prototype and put it on Kickstarter and say, wow, 25,000 people decided to buy this. I'm just gonna go into my basement and have those made and then sell them. Right? You'll have that kind of yeah, and, and again, uh, to add to Kilby, I'll like say, you know, our goal is, is for manufacturing to stay here in the United States, it's going to take productivity. And the formula for productivity is throughput divided by man hours. So for us, it's about, it's about moving that, that relationship one way or the other. It's not always about replacing a human. We might need the human there and triple or quadruple productivity. It might also be that we take that human and redeploy them to another or a more beneficial process and then we're getting everything with the robot. So the key for is really long term for the United States is, is um, productivity. We've got a lot of great uh, advantages here. One is we're the biggest consumer in the world, right? We buy more stuff than anybody else. So the fact that we have all the other, to Kel's point, look at, your, look at your iPhone. How long does it take to get to the seven, to the eight, to the nine, to the 10? Not to say that they're not doing valuable work and understanding what their customer wants or there's not things, but a big part of that is because there's this huge ramp up process. 
the difference in making the change from seven to eight. It's not exclusively about creating the next thing. It's also about everything that goes into making the next thing, supply chain and all the rest of it. It becomes a very complex process that uh, a lot of companies are trying to short circuit now. That's why you see this emerging trend of offshore, where the 80s and the 90s, a lot of jobs in you know, manufacturing were going over to China. Now you're seeing manufacturing demand come back to the US because they don't want to have to deal with the complexities of an international supply chain like that. So you see a lot of companies like, you know, even local ones here like Stanley Black & Decker or Under Armour who have stated policies now of make where you sell, where they want their consumers to know that when they buy something, it was manufactured within 100 miles of where it was purchased. And so that's going to be a trend that you see continue to grow over the, the coming years. And in terms of productivity as well, with, with robots, one of the most interesting things that you see is a lot of people always talk about, oh, well, robots and automation are coming in and you know, it's going to cost jobs, things like that. But it's actually the opposite. In fact, if you look at most companies that employ uh, and, and put in place robotic automation, within 12 months or so, they're actually aggressively hiring more people because they're now in a position to do more business. Great. Um, so this is one, um, just thinking about again about our students here, um, what's something that you it is experienced in the workforce that you never thought you'd need to know how to do when you were back in school and things like that, taking classes? Pro programming a robot. <laughs> <laughs> That's my fault. Sorry. <laughs> just, just, just general, like, I don't know. Well, uh, uh, time studies. I spend a tremendous amount of time going to manufacturing plants and, and looking at every, sing every single thing they do in the process and timing it out to understand how we can decrease times, how we can eliminate times, how we can uh, delegate different tasks. I, you know, I do multiple time studies in plants each month. Yeah. Um, I think it's about, I mean, not that I didn't expect to do it, but, you know, I was an engineer, so I figured I'd be in my little cubby making the stuff that I'm making or programming, right? It's actually much more about working with people. Like the, you know, when you start a company, the amount of time that you spend managing people and taking that team of all those different people with different skills and making them work as one big machine, that's something that you have to have skills at. And it's really no matter what you do, uh, you have to be able to work with people and understand how they work together, what is driving them individually, how they're best motivated, um, you know, how to keep them happy. Those are the type of things that I didn't think I'd have to do as much as I, I did. So one last question before we open it up to you guys. Um, just in general, do you have advice for our uh, future engineers and or manufacturing production people here? I mean, I would say um, continue to be curious. That's I mean, probably what we've got all this where we are today is, is curiosity. Yeah, uh, I'm, my biggest one for you guys is don't be afraid to fail. Yes. Like, fail. Do badly on things because you will learn, you will learn stuff. Yeah, right? absolutely. Like, I, you have no idea how many times I've built a weldment, this blue thingy for this stand, for this robot. There's like eight of them, and most of them were pretty crappy. Excuse me. They were bad. This one's pretty good. It's not the best. Eventually something will go wrong with it and we'll fix it and we'll have a better one. That's how it works, right? You're never going to build something that's absolutely perfect. You're going to build something that's better than the last time you built it. And that's with everything. That's, that's whether you're doing math, it's whether you're doing science, it's anything that you're doing. Do your best, absolutely. But if you fail, use that information, use that knowledge and apply it to the next time so that you're better the next time. Yeah, I wouldn't say if you fail, I would say when you fail. <laughs> Ex expect failures to happen and you know, just, just accept it, learn what you can from it, and continue on. I mean, a lot of the ways that uh, startup companies ultimately succeed is through a series of failures, basically figuring out what doesn't work until they finally find what, what does work. You know, one of my favorite quotes from Edison when someone asked him how it felt to have failed to invent the light bulb 10,000 times, he, he retorted with, uh, I didn't fail at that, I, I found 10,000 ways to not make a light bulb. And for him, it was all about just failing and moving on to the, the next try until he ultimately succeeded. And, and we now have indoor electricity because of his tenacity. And so that's why you just have to keep trying and going at this stuff. And, you know, in the, the startup world as well, that's something that they actually reward you. As Nick said uh, earlier, one of the guys at the, the last panel we were at made the joke that you know VCs want to invest in people that have already lost someone else's money. That's actually true. 
VCs are more likely to fund a company if you've already started and failed at a previous startup company. So go out there, try, move fast, break things, and uh, fail. Great, thank you guys so much. Miss Wesley down here in the floor, and we want to open it up to questions from you guys that you didn't already provide me. So, so I'm wondering what makes your robot special? How is it different from what your competitors offer? This is only a one-hour show. <laughs> The key, the key thing about what we build is that it's easy to use. There's lots of robots out there. If you go into any big plant that's making cars or anything at volume, right, like Ford, GM, you're going to see tons of robots. Nothing is new about that. What's new about this is that we're making it so that that guy who's 65, who has a feature phone, who hates browsing the internet, that guy can learn how to use this robot. It has to be easy enough for him. It has to be like playing Candy Crush. Kel, could you go over there and yeah. just show us real quick some of the stuff that we have? Yeah. So what does it mean when you push the button and it changes from purple to blue or so blue to the green? So green sorry. means that it's in a position where it moves itself. Blue is in a position where I can actually move in. I'm just being confused sometimes. Oh, <laughs> All right. This probably is not going to work, but we will try. Okay. What it's actually going to do is it's actually going to blend between those three points. All right, well, I already failed because I messed up that third point. Put it further over here. And honestly, in a manufacturing environment, that kind of stuff is going to happen, right? You're going to do it wrong. What's valuable, though, is that it doesn't take a lot of time to correct that. It takes a few seconds to correct that. So now if I start again, bump up the speed a little bit. It's really, about, it's really about how fast it is to actually get the robot to do the things that you want it to do. And it's very simple. Like, I'm not writing any code. Right? I just have blocks. I put them together. I push a few buttons. Add another move.
going to go into a machine. That machine's then going to cut it into the little housing that covers the camera on your iPhone, right? But this block, somebody cut this with a saw because it's cheap, right? They were trying to save money. It's not exactly the same size as this block. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that if I grab it and I try and put it in the exact same place every time, it's not necessarily going to work because it's a different size, right? That's what we were talking about with the robot being intelligent, is you have to have the robot be able to adapt to actually deal with that type of variability. Even in a super high-tech factory, even at Tesla's factory, you still have issues like that where the world, the things that you're manipulating are not perfect. And the robot has to be able to deal with that just like you would. Well, if it didn't fit, you wiggle it around a little bit and it fits, right? The robot needs to be able to do those type of things. And having the user interface that is like your iPhone, that's fast and easy to program, means that you can very quickly get the robot to fuss with things like this, where it can deal with this type of thing. And, and the, so the other thing that's uh, interesting about what we learned is, and this goes back to what Nick was talking about with flexibility, is most of the time, when you buy a robot, you're Ford, right? That robot's going to take a piece of metal and it's going to bolt it into a car, okay? And it's going to do that a million times. You're never going to have to change it again until you start building a different car two years later, right? And the factories that we work with, they might want to change their process once a day. Not once every two years, once a day, right? So they can't spend a month changing the tooling and the robot. They can't... Uh, spend the time that it takes to, to do that. So what we have is we have a very easy stream. I don't know if you guys have ever played a first person shooter, but you have your guy, right? He's running around, he's got different weapons, he's got different packs, he's got different things that he can do, right? Stuff, his equipment. It's the same thing with this, right? You have the robot, there's all sorts of different grippers that I can put on the end of the robot. There's all sorts of different tooling that I can attach to the front of the stand here, to these ports all sorts of different industrial equipment, and it's like plugging a mouse into your computer, right? You swap this out, you hit a few buttons, just like in your first person shooter, and you're good to go, right? It's that easy. And that ability to very quickly take this robot that might have a gripper for, you know, dealing with big objects, and putting a much smaller, stronger gripper for something else on it, very fast, that's hugely valuable. It means that if, you know, Nick wants to move his robot from the machine where he's cutting cardboard to another machine where he's picking up finished boxes, and he needs to switch from a gripper that looks like this to a gripper that looks like a big suction cup, he needs to be able to do that fat graphically. And you can't do that with a normal robot. You can only do that with a, a system like ours with our software. So, sorry for the super long with the response. <laughs> Hi, so a lot of the seniors are probably thinking about going into like pre-med and then eventually medical school. And I've actually been told, oh, don't be a radiologist, don't go into radiology because pretty soon robots are going to be reading x-rays way better than humans ever could and more accurate and more efficient like more efficient so what are you guys thoughts on robots like doing surgeries and like if that would affect um future students going into med school so the application of machine learning and ai in the radiology space for example is one that, that's growing significantly while i was at uh, johns hopkins technology ventures uh, this is one of the areas that we looked at extensively was not only in radiology but also pathology which is, you know, identification of tumors and things like that. Um, that, that is a trend that is, is growing, and a lot of that stuff is, in fact, going to become automated. But the way it's becoming automated right now is, uh, is like a, a, an extra check. So you have like a radiologist or a pathologist looking at something, and then the computer will also do an additional check on that. It would, just to be perfectly honest with you, it would not surprise me if in, you know, 15 or 20 years, most of that type of analysis was in fact automated because it's all about pattern recognition. But, but I, look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that to deter you. Um, no. Yeah. no, I mean, that's like Ben said, right now the, those types of emerging technologies are tools. The other part of this is, is, I don't know if you guys have watched House, but right, the experience that a doctor has 
and the breadth of knowledge that they have is always required in a situation like that, right? So even if even if the doctor looks at this, you know, brand new piece of software that's telling him, well, you know, this patient may have cancer, you want his second opinion. You want that guy to stand there and be like, well, no, you know, this is actually just an abnormality. I've seen this before. Maybe this machine learning algorithm doesn't have data about that yet, right? It doesn't know yet. So that position isn't going to go anywhere soon. And that's, and if, if, for any of you thinking about medicine, there's a lot of emerging technology in the robotics and the automation and machine learning space that are starting to look similar, where it's like, oh, well, X is going to be completely automated in 20 years. 50% of the jobs um, that exist today didn't exist 10 years ago. Exactly. So, I mean, whether it's collaborative robots, pick it, your job is to go find that and, and master it. Yeah. yeah. Robots are not good at the, the nuance of stuff. They'll, they'll do a lot of really basic sort of group analysis, but you know that what we call the edge cases, where you only see something 0.0001% of the time. The robot's not an issue, not good at that at all. Right. The other thing is, is for a lot of people who want to go into medicine, it's about the people, right? It's less about the science. I mean, it's about the science too, right? But it's really about the people. You want to help people, right? An algorithm is never going to be the one to tell a family member that they have cancer. It's going to be a person, right? So that person's always going to be there. Remember, it's about bringing up smart people to do smart things. Exactly. Oh, so if I was a company and I was looking to purchase one of these robots, uh, how much would that cost me? Uh, this, this, well, we should talk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so there's two parts to that, right? So this this particular unit, and I'll just keep some specs, right, to understand what it's capable of. This arm, the collaborator arm, will reach about 52 inches. So when we're talking to a customer, we need to understand what they're doing. This unit has a 52 inch reach and it'll handle about 22 pounds of payload. For that and everything that goes with it, it's about a $92,000 piece of equipment. Oh, wow. That's right. So if you guys want to swap out your Mercedes, your parents' Mercedes, or these bad boys, we can help you. But remember, the thing about a manufacturing plant, right? So let's just talk about this. I hear, I hear the buzz about it. Uh, yeah. So if you go into a manufacturing plant, right? If we look at a multi shift operation, so I'll just give you a, a real quick break even. This is some numbers we look at all the time. If, if you have a $15 an hour person working one shift, the cost of this on a monthly basis is exactly the same as that person. If you go up $1 or add a shift or add two shifts or add $2 or $3, it goes up exponentially in savings. So if you look at that from a, a, you know, a clutch the pros moment of 92 grand, that's one thing. But when we're in a manufacturing plant, we are looking at the total cost, the total cost of humans, the opportunity cost of what the human could be doing if they weren't doing this all day. You know, right now we've got an application where we're picking and placing uh, bottles of gas into a tester. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, pretty smart guy does this all day long, all day long. Our goal is to take this and do that task and have that guy go somewhere else in the plant and do something that really matters. Is that, that, that's kind of important, but if we can do it with this, the savings for the customer is exponential, right? And they've taken a human that they're dying to get. We say something important about onshore because I've heard you guys talk about onshore. If we attempted to do any significant onshoring right now, there's not nearly enough workforce to even begin to do it, not even close. So it's tools like this that are going to give United States manufacturers any shot of bringing any of that back. So it's, it's not about uh, you know, robot in, human out. It rarely is. It's about robot in. Thank goodness I have six jobs. What was it today? Six out of ten manufacturing jobs are going to So it's about 700,000 unfilled jobs in manufacturing today that because of the aging workforce is expected to balloon to 2 million by 2025. So the short answer is, is the money that you're going to save, even though that high sticker price is like, man, it's a lot. The money that you're going to save, especially if you're working like a three shift job like that, you're going to pay that off in like eight months. And then you're making money, right? Because you paid it for it, it's done. It's not like a person where they have to like eat and stuff, you know? They have to take care of their family. <laughs> Vacation, lunch breaks, you don't have any of that anymore. It's paid off, it's just, you're just say, pocketing all of that cash. That's how it ends up working out for this company. Yeah, you know, you know, we have an application here locally where with injection molding, they run the lights out third shift. All the humans go home, they turn the robot on, it makes parts all night. It sends the owner emails along the way talking about productivity. Owner gets up and says, hey, look at that. My task me produced 700 things last night. Lights out, third shift, they literally run in the dark. More questions? Any others? Uh, 
kind of piggybacking on those last two questions, do you think that in the long run that person that is getting paid fifteen dollars an hour in technology will take his spot in the workforce in the long run? Oh, let me start because there was a great there's a great study that came out a couple days ago. I think it was done by CNN Money. It talked about exactly what you're saying. What are the you know what are the jobs that could be at risk? And I think we don't pay enough attention to some of the things that are already going. Everyone thinks about a robot like this, right? It's an arm and it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a Terminator and all that stuff. Look, ATM machines, look what ATM machines do. You guys check out, who uses, who uses self-checkout at the Safeway, right? If you look at what's going on, I mean, while it's not a big scary robot arm where you picture a human leading, I mean, that, that has been going on forever. If you look at driverless cars, um, you know, talk about driverless cars, I mean, Driverless trucks would be a big thing for this country. There's a huge shortage in people that want to drive trucks back and forth from California. It's another pain point for manufacturers to come back to the United States. So to your point, some jobs are going to be more jeopardy than others without question. The odd one to yours, doctors and nurses, almost at the absolute bottom, the exact reason that Kel said, you know, that, that there is a human nuance to it. So yes, some of those jobs are absolutely going to be in jeopardy. All three of us spent a lot of time today with workforce development talking about you know, how do we get these folks that may not have the skills that they need retrained and reemployed. So I think that's that's the, the real big challenge. But that's the that's the history of innovation too. I mean, if you look at the type of jobs that people are doing today, it's not the type of jobs that people were doing 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And that's that's okay. We move forward as a society. I mean, no one today actually has a job as a, a lollygagger. You no, know, a lollygagger was someone whose job was to follow behind the guy with the, the scythe who was cutting wheat and basically pick up the, the wheat for later threshing. And we don't need that anymore because we have, we have combine harvesters. And people that were previously doing that have been able to go on to become you know, doctors, lawyers, bankers, roboticists, because we no longer have to have most of our people involved in growing food. We will reach a point where we don't have to have most of our people involved in manufacturing and other aspects of the economy. And that's okay too, because there's just tremendous opportunity for new things out there. You know, there are always new companies being created. One of my favorite is a company called Planetary Resources that they have a stated mission of actually capturing and mining asteroids. And so in 50 years, you might very well see opportunities for literally asteroid mining because it's the just nonstop pace of innovation that allows humanity Yeah, we got another one. Okay, so I know this is kind of asked earlier, but I was wondering how much capital you guys actually have and when do you actually expect to break even? Um, so we've raised almost $4 million in venture capital. We will probably end up raising another you know, couple hundred million in venture capital over the next five or six years before we reach a point where we will start to reach break even. So in the, the venture capital world, the way, the way venture capital works is the VCs will go out and talk to a bunch of rich people and get them to contribute money to their, their venture funds. That money is then locked up for a period of seven to 10 years. And so what the VCs do is they'll go out and they'll make 100 investments. They actually expect uh, about 85 of those 100 investments to just totally fail. They expect another like 10 to 13 of them to do pretty well, make a little bit of money, and then one or two of them to make a tremendous amount of money. But they expect all of that to happen in a, in a seven to 10 year period. So at the end of that seven year period, you need to either be profitable enough to IPO and become a publicly traded company, or reach a certain point where you can be sold at some multiple of the investment to, to some large company. So to, you know, that's a, a rambling way of saying roughly six or seven years. And you freshmen in the back, don't be shy. It's hard for me to see you. Um, aware and like rule the world. <laughs> so my moment has come. <laughs> There's a lot of discussion about. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of, yeah, well, I, I'm there we go. Uh, it's, it's, eventually we will have robots that can compare to people. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take way longer than we think. Because it's an insanely hard 
problem. If there was a robot revolution today, all you would have to do is stand on this one stair up. From, like, if there was a robot right there, it's a little robot, you just have to, like, one flight up and you're, it can't get you, right? <laughs> like, we, we talk a lot about the, the technology that we build as being absolutely groundbreaking, but compared to, like, what people do on a daily basis and even, like, what I'm capable of doing with my hands, it's like nothing. Yeah. So I mean, it's going to take an insanely long time. One day, one day, a couple hundred years, maybe, but not any time soon. We're going to hold it. So that's the sure way of saying the most amazing machine by far is the human. Oh, yeah. close. I mean, you, you, you are a complex machine with a hundred trillion cells. Each of those cells has you know, a billion molecules in it at least. So you have a hundred trillion billion moving parts inside of you. And we as humans, the only thing we've been able to mass produce is a car. And that has on average 50,000 parts in it. And you can barely get that thing to go 5,000 miles without a tune-up. So right. we're, we're a ways off from there. Right. And, your, and your capabilities, what you can do, have been tuned by a hundred million years of trial and error by yeah. So, the most interesting thing, though, about the uh, you know AIs gaining uh, more traction and power and becoming self-aware is we always assume that oh it's going to become self-aware it's going to put everyone out of work but once these things achieve self-awareness there's no guarantee that they're going to want to do the thing that you were programmed for so you know you might you might train up an AI to be a mechanical engineer and it wants to go off and write 18th century English prose and there's not much you can do about that. The, the scariest thing, though, when it comes to AIs and their computational power is not whether or not we will make good AIs or bad AIs, because ultimately, you know, with a complex individual, you will have good, you will have bad. The scariest thing will be if we make indifferent AIs. AIs that don't care about us any more than we care about stepping on an ant. And that's one of the things that we'll have to be, I think, most careful about as we go into those, those brave new frontiers of uh, technological development. One last question here. No favoritism. <laughs> what would you say is the best undergrad major for going into advancements in robotics? I would say that um, <clears throat> It, there's not really a best. I would say that if you want to be making stuff like this, mechanical engineering, computer science, and electrical engineering are really uh, the big ones. However, for the business people out there, like the startups that are coming out right now, the technology startups are in desperate need of people who are tech savvy but also have an MBA, have you know undergraduate degree in economics, right? So it's if you if you want to be on the technical side. Those three majors are really are really it, um, but any of the the hard engineering uh, fields can get into robotics. I mean, I have friends who are civil engineers who are hugely into robotics because of construction equipment, right? So it really depends. But like the classical three are electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and computer science. Just depending on whether you like to make things that move, make things that use electricity, or make code, right? That's really. Very and fortunately for me, somebody has to sell this stuff too. So that's the other thing. Somebody's got to sell this. Stuff. Yeah. Well, first we need to give a huge round of applause. Thanks, and I'm going to give you guys some instructions. Uh, one more round of applause for them.